Hello, everyone. Uh, let's call the Thursday of May 19th uh, business meeting of Borough Council to order. Uh, let's begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So, we, before this meeting and after the last meeting, we held an executive session to discuss uh, distribution of borough property, not related to a one state line. Uh, that was on the 10th and the 19th. We've held two executive sessions uh, to discuss disposition of borough property. Oh, we also and discussed, also discussed personnel person. issues at uh, the one on the 19th. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Bryant, we call the roll. Sure. Council President Fred Bush. Here. Council Vice President Michelle Panopoulos. Here. Council Member Barbara Fortner. Here. Council Member Rob McGrady. Here. Council Member Cindy Rickards. Here. Council Member Bob Weisbord. Here. Council Member Ira Winston. Here. Mayor Andrea Deutsch. Here. Here. Okay. Uh, are there any uh, agenda additions or changes? Okay. Move on to my comments. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, everyone's wearing masks. Uh, the Montgomery County has moved in officially into moderate transmission um, of COVID. Uh, it is, COVID rates continue to rise. Um, so uh, take advantage of the federal government's offer of COVID tests. Uh, I just ordered eight more uh, yesterday. Uh, take advantage of extra boosters um, that are available. Um, and uh, please just be careful, everyone. Um, that's it. So, uh, Ms. Mayor, do you have comments or report? Very brief. Um, I just want to tag on to Fred's comments and say if you feel sick, please uh, stay home. Uh, and, and it is really advised to wear a mask when you're in an indoor setting. Uh, so, when uh, you're in our stores and. Uh, in place inside settings, um, it's advised that you wear a mask to keep yourself safe. And and those masks, it, in best practices, should be KN95s or N95s that are well fitting. They are the ones that provide you the most protection. I just wanted to encourage people to to do what they can to keep themselves safe. The only other thing is I want to remind folks that. Um, a week from Monday, we, our Memorial Day Parade is back, and it's very exciting. Thanks to John Norman for organizing everything and getting it together. Um, and so it begins, I believe, at 930. And uh, it should take the usual route, you know, around and then down. So, uh, and then followed by a ceremony at the War Memorial. Um, so uh, please encourage everybody to come out and uh, give thanks for those who've made the ultimate sacrifice. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. All right, so the next item is a uh, discussion with SEPTA um, about the Route 44 bus service and a proposal for microtransit. Um, and then public comment will be after that um, discussion. We don't anticipate uh, a council vote. So. All right, so I'm very grateful um, to a couple of folks here uh, who are with us from SEPTA tonight. I'm going to unmute uh, both of them and add them to the screen, and we look forward to hearing any update they can uh, provide on the Route 44 bus. So, uh, Dan and Harley, thank you both for being here tonight with us. Um, thank you. My name is, is Dan Nemeroff. I am the, the project manager for Bus Revolution. Uh, I'm here. Uh, Wendy, do you want to introduce yourself as well? We have one other person from SEPTA on the call. I just want to give her a chance to introduce herself. <laughs> Oh, sorry, let me, uh, that, sorry yeah, about that one. Yeah, I didn't see stuff in your name, so uh, sorry about that there. <laughs> there you go. But she's still here. No, I just, oh. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Can, can uh, that, now. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, good evening. I'm Wendy Green Harvey from SEPTA's Public and Government Affairs Department, and uh, as I, I don't want to belabor the the uh, 
the moment, but Dan Nemiroff was introducing himself. He is a project manager for Bus Revolution. And Harley, if you would like to introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Harley Cooper. I work in Septus Service Planning Department. I'm managing the implementation of microtransit as part of the bus revolution. So Dan's going to do the presentation, but I'm happy to answer any, or at least try to answer any microtransit um, um, questions after. Great. So I, I am, okay, so I'm going to try to share a little bit because I'm sure you have a lot of questions, but I want to provide a little bit of context about, about of uh, the project. It says I can't share, so maybe I'll just talk. Um, so where we are in the bus revolution process is we are in the scenario evaluation phase. So um, yeah. last right, month- right, so I'm gonna make you a co-host. So if you do have something on your screen you wanna share, you'd be able to do that. Okay, I'm perfect. Gonna, I'm gonna do the same for Wendy and Carly so they can unmute themselves if they need to add anything. Great, so let me just show from current slide. Okay, so um, this is just a, a very, very simplified project approach graphic. It shows you where we are in the process. So we, we began with last year, starting with a lot of background, uh, really trying to understand the current state of the system. We looked at uh, ridership pre-COVID, during COVID, and, and, you know, I guess what we thought of at the time as late stage COVID, but who knows. Um, we did a bunch of, we did, we, we did a bunch of public engagement uh, that culminated in a survey that was done in the, in last fall. Um, and then um, we took all that information, all that analysis that we did with the survey responses and put together two different scenarios uh, that we think are improvements over the current bus system. We are going, we are in a, another round of engagement right now. Uh, we are sharing we are these two, these two uh, options with um, people. Uh, we actually just came off a, a different call talking about it, the, the network in North Philadelphia. Um, and we're going to get public feedback. We're going to then take all that feedback and make um, our decision as to what one, the preferred network looks like, and then share that back out again in the fall. And um, like I said before, there are two network options. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead. Um, there are two network options, but they... Um, just because just the, the the existing network is always there so but we know what people have think about it they've been they've been complaining about it for years so we're going to take all of this public feedback we get uh, and turn it into sort of this preferred option uh I'll, I'll bring the slides up in a minute and we can talk specifically about route 44 um but just again more context the the options are both cost neutral, which means it's done with the same operating budget, the same number of vehicles, same number of operators at, as as we have in spring 2022. Uh, we are going to use this as an opportunity to identify future enhancements if we are uh, granted an increase in an operating budget, which is obviously awesome, and you know we hope happens, but uh, we haven't been guaranteed that at this point. But it is something the general manager uh, would like us to do. Um, both network options feature simplified network design, which means less patterns, fewer turns, more direct service, uh, frequent and reliable connections, uh, increasing access, um, and then improved service quality again, which is easier to use and understand, more consistent service levels during the week and on the weekend, that kind of thing. I'm going to go through this really quickly uh, just so we can get to your questions. But um, the way the networks are shared are we've broken them out into sort of these tiers of frequency with um, frequent bus service, um, you know, either 10 or 15 minute service, 30 minute service, and then uh, 60 minute service or 60 max service. And, and what these designations mean are the, the worst a route gets is 10 minute service between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. Um, you know, at least during the week, we're still trying to figure out the weekend service. It's, it's a little more complicated, complicated, but generally that's where we're going. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, I'll hold most of the microtransit talk for Harley, but we are using this project as an opportunity to introduce the concept of microtransit or just sort of on-demand flex service. Harley, do you want to talk for a minute about this? So, so the idea behind microtransit is we are going to replace some of our poorly performing fixed route services, which tend to be on the geographic fringes of our, our network as, you know, sort of the farther stretches of Chester County and um, Montgomery County and, and Bucks County. 
um, and we will be replacing them with micro transit zones. So that will be on demand or you schedule it in advance, um, sort of like the next generation of, of dial a ride, but you use a, a cell phone app or you can use our call center to schedule that. Um, and um, beyond that, there are a few other, we'll also be using it to replace some of our regional rail feeder service. So we have a few bus routes, which are, are, are not um, <laughs> near in our birth, but um, that feed into regional rail stations and connect the regional rail to some suburban office parks. Um, so we'll be also be looking at it for those purposes. Um, It'll be curb to curb service. That's the model. We're kind of working through a lot of the service design for microtransit, but what we've been talking about at this point is curb to curb. So it would take you to, um, you know, similar to a bus stop. Um, and um, but they're, they're sort of different models that we're working through with that. Um, and it would be priced the same as a uh, transit trip. Um, so the same as riding a bus, and it would be fully ADA accessible. Um, so that is the model that we're we're working through right now. Um, I don't, Dan, is that? <laughs> don't no, that's wanna... good. No, that was perfect. Okay. I, I think that I think the the key thing here is that we view it as as part of our system. It's sort of a part of our sort of suite of modes. We don't view it as a standalone mode. I just want to you know, but I think that was a good. Yeah, it's fully integrated. It's seamless, and the idea is that there are certain areas that are just it's real. You know, density is so low that it, it's hard to provide fixed mm -hmm. route service, and our fixed route service is pretty infrequent. It's like every sixty minute minutes on some of these routes. And the idea being that microtransit um, provides a level of customer convenience um, that, that we think will add, a, that we think will provide a benefit um, to our customers. So. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, real quickly again, uh, network option. So there's again, two network options. Uh, they are, I think they are more similar to each other than the current, they are to the current network but some key, key differences between the two. Network option one is simpler and more streamlined. It has much fewer routes than our current system. And that's not to say it's a reduction in overall service. It's not, it's the same number of service hours just consolidated onto fewer routes. Network, so, so network option one, because of the sort of intense frequency is sort of you know, where we think it's needed it is sort of the less waiting. And then network option two puts some of that service back and that is the less walking of the two. Um, Here's network option one, just sort of geographically, you know, on, on a network level. And all of these, uh, these are all available online. And, and you know, you can, you can do a deep dive. Uh, you know, the red is the, is the 10 minutes or better. The purple is the 15. And the blue is the 30 minutes 30 or better. Minutes. And the, the key here is there's no 60 minute service. Everything is 30 minutes or better, which is a huge departure from today. Uh, those grayed out areas are the, the, the identified micro transit zones in option one. Uh, network option two, there's a lot more purple and blue, not as much red. Uh, and there's yellow. Uh, those are the 60 minute routes that we've effectively put back onto the map, the map. Um, and there are fewer micro transit zones. And again, just to kind of reiterate what Harley said before, we think micro transit um, in some of these really far flung areas is an improvement. Um, again, here are just some, some summary stats um, between the two. You can see the number of bus routes, uh, the number of frequent routes, obviously network option one over half of all the routes uh, we've identified. Oh, we've identified. Um, and that includes uh, quite a few routes in the suburbs. Um, annual bus hours is roughly the same, but you know there, there's going to be a lot of work done on that one as we refine our concept. And then the percent of riders riders sure. within a quarter mile of the network. Um, I'd like to take a pause here because obviously you invited us, and I want to make sure we have time. I don't know how much time we have, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to. You know, we can talk through more specifics now, um, as as Harley and Wendy can attest to. I could literally talk forever, so um, I'm happy to just stop and, and answer questions at this point. And we can share and, and, and talk more, that kind of thing, uh, as, as you ask questions. Uh, yeah, so I mean, the agenda item on our agenda uh, was about the future of the Route 44 bus service, which is the one I guess that comes by here. So you could address how the Route 44 is affected in each of these scenarios. Sure. Um, the Route 44 is not in either scenario. It's in in it's not in the first scenario at all. And in the second scenario, uh, we've replaced the the Narberth and Gladwin pieces with microtransit. That is how um, we've 
that is what the two proposals say. Um, I, I'll, I'll say a couple things about the Route 44, and I want to add that I'm a, an Ardmore resident, so I know I know this area real well. Um, but um, the one of the things that's one of the things about the 44 that's really important is that the, the by far the highest ridership on the 44 is on City Avenue, um, which has a lot of other service on it. Um, so that makes up outside of the city center city that makes up the vast majority of the ridership on the route. Um, the other thing that I think is worth noting is that the 44 is a route that always had really, really, really low off peak and weekend ridership. It's always been a very commuter um, oriented route. Um, so what has happened um, over the last two years is that routes that are highly reliant on typical commuting service have effectively their ridership has not come back. So the ridership while a route, like I'm trying to think of like a route, like, like a, a route, like the one Oh six or a route, like, um, I don't know, like a route, like the 40 routes that operate like either in the city or routes that operate sort of in other parts of the suburbs, those routes are back to about 50 to 60% of where they were pre COVID or like the 44 is like still at like 20%, 25% pre COVID. Um, so I think that, you know, it's a situation where, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky kind of, uh, thread uh, right. line we're walking, but that's, those are how the two proposals deal with the 44. As I said before, um, the existing network is always there. Um, we, we know that, you know, we know that we may have to think about putting elements of it back into our, one of the preferred option, but that, that, you know, uh, you asked, so that's, that's that's where we are with that one. But like I said before, we're we're soliciting a lot of feedback. So um, this is a really good opportunity for people to provide input into you know those ideas and let me know if if they like them or they think they're bad or or what have you. Hi Dan, uh, Mayor Deutsch here. Um, I, I had a question. When it looked like the micro transit, it looked like you had to book it like a day in advance. Um, no, how? What's the shortest time you can book it? Can you? Like how much lead time will they need to know that they need they need a service? So that's a, a service parameter that um, we we haven't gotten to that decision yet. But that's a policy decision once we procure the software that we'll set up in the software. What we've sort of been talking about is, um, uh, well. You know, we haven't, we've, you know, we've talked about the, uh, having the ability to schedule it in advance and then the ability to book it in real time. Um, and with the idea, we're kind of playing with this idea of a 30, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't, I'm struggling to answer that because we haven't got, that's like a very detailed policy yeah. question. We haven't quite gotten there yet. Yeah. Um we're, we're still working through some of the pieces with microtransit, thinking about, um, you know, what kind of vehicles we would procure for this service. Um, and we haven't procured our software for it yet, but that's a policy decision we would get at um, the, a little bit later on. It kind of seems like this is a, a more affordable Uber, kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we like, sometimes people describe, we try not to do that, but some people do describe it as like Uber and Lyft meets like a transit vehicle. Um so you schedule, and that's, you know, Dial-A-Ride has been around for a really long time, but this current generation, generation. that we're calling microtransit really came from those TNCs like Uber and Lyft and kind of saying, mm -hmm. well, you know, we're losing a lot of riders to Uber and Lyft and what can we learn from what they're providing? Why are people going to that mode? And so some of the things that we've seen are people like that, um, to access to information they want to be able to look at their phone yeah. and see when the you know the vehicle is coming and they have that um and the ability to you know request a, a trip and to schedule it that way so we're that, yeah. so yes you're very right <laughs> yeah uh, I, I think something that's also important to note uh, the uh, and i think um that's is that when is that microtransit isn't a good fit everywhere um like if you look at the, both of the network options like it's not we don't view it as something that's going to work in the city, really. Um, there's always going to be a, when you're in the city, there's always going to be a fixed route that's close by that's going to run at, you know, a much higher frequency than, than um, a, you know, microtransit would. But in, in some parts of the region and in network option two, you know, Narberth and Gladwin are sort of included in that zone. Um, so that's, you know, that's sort of part of the underlying philosophy too. We don't want to, part of the, part of the reason we're doing this project is that we have a lot of redundant services that compete with each other. And 
Um, we don't want microtransit to compete with fixed route bus service. We want it to be a complement to fixed route service and a complement to regional rail service. Right. Um, so that's that's part of the, the philosophy here. Yeah, the, the rule of thumb that we use is if um, a bus route serves 10 or more passengers per hour, it, it makes sense to keep that on a bus. Mm -hmm. um, but we have routes that have productivity is, you know, more like five, six, seven passengers per hour. But we really need to keep that service where it is because people rely on it, but it's just not productive and we mm -hmm. can't put the frequencies out there that people need. And so microtransit allows us to have a more frequent, especially in scenario one that, that Dan touched on, yeah. you know, a frequent 30 minute like spine to our network and then the microtransit that feeds into it. So it gives us, um, you know, it gives people access to the system through microtransit and then, a, you know, a frequent trip on the, um, on the fixed route. Finally, finally, finally Sorry, uh, Narbeth is a very green community. We're very environmentally um, conscious. Um, I understand that the buses probably are, are uh, use a whole lot of fuel. Will you be using uh, green vehicles? I think um, Dan's, do you want to talk about the ZEB buses? Yeah, sure. Um, no, that. That's true. And and that's I do, like as, as a local I resident, I do commend the borough for, for being so progressive on those fronts. So, um, the idea, so SEPTA is going through a very large scale um, ZEB study, a zero emission bus study, and um, transitioning from our, our sort of current, you know, hybrid diesel to um, electric or, or, you know, FCEB buses, or fuel cell buses um, is extremely complex. Um, we're committed to doing it. I don't have any timeline for you. Um, that, that commitment will carry over to the microtransit space. So, but that like part of the microtransit playbook project that Harley is managing is going to be sorting through procurement. Um, and we, we want to make sure that the, the procurement of the vehicles is consistent with the authority's greater goals of, of transitioning to zero emission vehicles. So, um, and, and we want to do it correctly. Like um, there's a lot of complicated things that we have to confront about adopting a microtransit network. Like, saying we're going to do it is kind of like the easy part, like figuring out actually how it works is, is really tricky. Um, so we want to do it really, we want to do it right. We want to do it smart, it's smart and, and it's going to require a little more time. So where you might see bus network redesign changes go into effect next year, uh, microtransit will likely extend. It'll go later. It won't, it's unlikely to happen all at once just because there are, are much, um, there are a lot of serious questions that, 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 that the microtransit playbook project has to ask. So I actually have had some experience with microtransit bus service. Um, so in my point, I, I was one of the things I'm really proud of is uh, there's the Doylestown Area Regional Transit System, or mm -hmm. DART, and I was really proud of expanding that bus service from just Doylestown to the New Britain area, mm -hmm. and I got to about how it worked. And part of what they offered was similar to what um, has been described here by SEFTA, is given the density of that route, or you know, or given that area of you know the state, the lower density of the bus route, a um, micro transit service was offered in their off-peak time. So especially like in the evenings, uh, on the weekends, even on late like Friday and Saturday night for some of the college students in the area, and it was a tremendously um, successful program. Um, I don't think they even had an app, so I get to, you know, a lot of credit for thinking about doing that. It was a literal, you had to do, um, like, make a phone call uh, to get it. And it seemed to be really popular and worked out well. Um, you know, so I, I just want to maybe allay some of the fears about how microtransit might work. Um, admittedly, in a less dense area than, than what we're talking about here, but I think a similar sort of ridership situation to what was described in terms of riders per hour and that kind of thing. All right, so I have, uh, I have some concerns here, uh, concerning that we are being asked to give up something that we, is a known sort of reliable quantity, which is the, the 44 bus, which um, for you know, something new, um, I understand a lot of places where microtransit has been adopted, it's proven, they, they've stopped doing it for reasons of cost, that, 
it doesn't serve as many people as they're expecting. You know, there's significant cost to you know running a car for one or two people an hour. You know, it's it gets expensive compared to a to a bus. Um, so I guess I'd like to know what would happen if we were assigned to a micro transit dump and then it proved to be more expensive uh, than you would expect. Uh, are we going to lose everything at that point? Um, I mean, I think that, so a couple of things. I think the first is that um, like sort of the, the metrics that we use to evaluate micro transit, like the metrics that we use to evaluate all of our services are going to be something that definitely gets, um, you know, thought through and vetted, um, you know, publicly um, as part of this project. Um, I think it's a really fair question. Um, you know, if we, if we make a change and it doesn't bear immediate fruit, um, like how would we adjust it? I think the one thing I can say is that um, I, I think that whatever we wind up implementing in the end, I think that we have to let it um, season for a while. Uh, I don't think it's something where we're going to make a bunch of changes, uh, changes on a scale that we've never done before, and then just give it a few months or give it a year and, and kill it. I think that's unlikely. Um, the other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, one of the things we want to do um, through this project and through sort of, and as we go forward, is we want to make um, our service development process a lot more responsive and 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 not not so reactive not not finding out about stuff down the line we want to we want our development process to be transparent and responsive to changes on the ground and that that type of thing so i think um i don't have like a clear-cut answer for you um you know we have these two options but like i said before the route 44 um does have you know there, there may be changes that we haven't considered that you retain some of the route 44 um but 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 you know, I think the commitment is we know we need to make some changes um, and we want to make those changes sort of understandable and clear. And, you know, we'll be, you know, talking to you more through this process. And then, like I said before, like microtransit will likely come later, which would likely mean that, you know, the Route 44 or something would remain, you know, in, you know, in and around Narberth um, until, you know, microtransit may come along. But we haven't figured out exactly how that transition works yet. Yeah, I just want to add something to that and sort of expand on, on what Dan mentioned. You know, one of the tasks in Bus Revolution is evaluating and expanding our service standards and our service development process. And we currently have um, this board approved definition of a major service change. And so if we had a very poorly performing route, and we wanted to discontinue it, there's a whole process behind discontinuing it. And that protects the people who rely on that service, right? They can come to our public hearing, they can testify. We take all of that into account. And so as we're working with our bus revolution consultants to update our service standards, you know, I think that's a really excellent point. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's something that we will build into um, both the service standards for micro transit, but then also that service development process and, and, and build in some safeguards, um, you know, so that if micro transit is not um, productive enough, if it's not cost effective enough, um, that it, and it's not serving the community well, that we would have, you know, an official board approved process that the public, all of our stakeholders have. Um, an opportunity to to comment on it. And I'll just also point out, I mean, I looked at your analysis of the Route 44 bus on the Bus Revolution site, um, and it talks about Narberth Station having a higher than usual proportion of people uh, getting on and off. Um, it's, in terms of the number of people boarding, um, it's more than a lot of the uh, routes that are continuing. I mean, it's, it's 33 per hour, I guess that includes the city line routes that you were mentioning. Um, so, I mean, I, I looked at this and I looked at your sort of performance metrics from, I guess, 2019, which is before the pandemic, and mm -hmm. it was still on the uh, kind of acceptable level. And some of the routes that are being kept are, uh, were well below. It. So, you know, I, so I, I guess I'm, I'm a little skeptical that it's uh, beyond saving um, or that it's not worthwhile to continue as a, as a rep, but, um, yeah. Question. I think I'm going to let other people, uh, ask questions. This is just a clarification question. 
Because I didn't, I'm not sure I understood or heard properly. Okay, so there's two network options being considered right now. Network option two would be the one with the microtransit. Transit here. Okay. Well, oh, is involved in both networks. I, what I didn't understand, Dan, is that you, I think after I, maybe I asked you about how Rule 44 was affected, I didn't understand you said it's not in either scenario. In one, it's just not there. In two, mm -hmm. it's So does that mean in network option one, it's just not there at all? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, you were cutting out a lot. I'll, I, mean, I think I caught the question. So there are two network options. In network option one, Route 44 is gone and there's no there's no service replacing it. In network option two, it's been replaced by microtransit. Um, so those are the two network options that we're getting feedback on now. I just, I, I just when I'm, I'm hearing conversation about 44, I realize there's really two 44s in our area because there's the 44 via Narberth, which intersects, has a hub with the Narberth train station. Mm -hmm. And there's the 44 that, that just travels directly al along Montgomery Avenue. So are you, um, when you're talking about the, f uh, the, the microtransit option, would, are you assuming that the 44 that travels Montgomery Avenue would continue and there would be a microtransit option for the Via Narver Park at the train station hub? Or? No. So the, the 44 has, has, many, has, a, has a few different patterns. There's the two that you said before, but then there's parts that go out, go out to Gladwin as well. Um, so the, the way micro the way we've thought through microtransit and Harley can jump in, it's like Narber station would become sort of the contact point for the microtransit network, like the regional rail station for people who wanted to go to points sort of load, either, either they were on Montgomery Avenue or out in Gladwin, which would also be losing, um, it's fixed route bus service. Um, they could use, they would, they would come to, they would, um, they could either there would be a microtransit zone that would effectively cover like Montgomery Avenue out to Gladwin. So that would be how people would, would, would use the microtransit network. I think I have that right, Harley. We may, we have a lot to figure out here, but that's, I think the general gist of it. What I was saying before though, is um, like, we're sitting where we have, this we have network network. Network, but we're also, you know, the, the current, the current network, like, the current system is always something that we have to take into consideration too. So we're not talking about it during this phase of the project very much, but it's something that's always there. Understand that. Yeah. Well, and, and also just to add, when we talk about the, the two networks and, and Dan might've said this, I just want to reiterate it because I think it's important. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about implementing either one of mm -hmm. these networks no. as they're, they're presented. It's really about creating a dialogue with the public and, to you know, get an exchange of ideas going, so that we can, you know, we kind of put two really big ideas out there to have conversations mm -hmm. like this. And um, we are doing a lot of public en engagement um, in the field at transportation centers at community events to, to talk to to mm -hmm. folks about this. Um, so just because you see the two network options there, it's not black and white. Yeah, thank you. I didn't say that, but that's a really good point. We're not asking people to vote. It's not like a binary choice. It's very much like here are two ideas. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you hate. A lot of what people don't like doesn't refers more to um, what's happening currently. So, it, really, there are three networks that we're considering. But that's the the point is not to say we're either implementing one or two. The point is that we're going to have to sort of figure out what the best path forward is. It's about putting different ideas out there, like Harley said. I have a question. Well, when do you plan on making this decision as to which what you're going to record with? Um, we will. We're going to. We're going to be out with this round of engagement until the end of June. So people are going to be submitting, um, you know, input on our survey or emailing us uh, through the end of June. Um, then we're going to spend the summer putting together that preferred network option. We'll be back out in the public with the preferred option, which is going to be one option. Which and it will be sort of this is what we would like to do. What do you think? And then. We'll be soliciting feedback on that one for two months, probably September through November. Um, and then we'll go back into the lab, you know, at the end of 2022, um, address the feedback that we got on the preferred option. And then in January or so, we would begin um, the implementation phase of the project, which does not mean we would be implementing a new bus network in January. It means we would start our, our hearing and board process 
in 2023. So there's there's still the rest of this round of engagement and the next round of engagement to give input. Um, and we anticipate having a sort of what, I, what it means, a final decision um, towards the end of this year. Because even when we go live with the preferred option, we know there's going to be some changes that we have to make. Yeah, feedback. So I, I wouldn't anticipate a final decision until the end of the year. Thank you. Barbara? So I just wanted to clarify, because I think I heard a couple of times something along the lines of like, the existing network will always be there. And I don't quite understand so, Sorry. Yeah, sorry. What I mean is that it's always something that we have to keep in mind. It's not, not like it will always be operating. It's always something that we have to keep in mind when we make these changes. A lot of, um, you know, we have the two options that we've created now, and then people are, you know, a lot of the feedback we're getting is really in relation to what we're changing of the current network. So we're always going to have to think about what the current network does and see if there's ways, see if there's things that we've missed or we need to put back in in our final, in our network. That's what I meant. I'm sorry if I didn't explain. I'm sorry that okay. I didn't. I thought you were saying somehow the Route 44 was still going to be there. No, I no, I no. And, no. And I want to, and I mean, this conversation is playing out all over the region. Like we are making, this is, this is not something um, we've ever done before. SEPTA has never done a comprehensive redesign before. Um, but, you know, so we know that a lot of people have a lot of strong feelings about everything from what streets the route goes on to what number it is. Um, and we're trying to balance all of these things uh, because our, our, we feel like our, we have to cha make changes in our system. Um, and so that's, that's what we're doing. But, but like I said, um, this, is a very, this is a process that's going to play out very publicly. And we are really trying to take this input into consideration. So, you know. And just for Narvik folks listening to this conversation at this moment, how would they provide input? Um, um, right. So there's lots of different ways. Um, I would say the best way, because it's the easiest to aggregate, is to go to septabusrevolution.com and fill out a survey. Um, it takes, it a, few takes minutes. a few minutes. You'll have to walk through. I mean, you can walk through the two different network options. Uh, there's like a nice little narrative. So that's the best way to do it. If you don't want to do that, um, you can email the project at septa. At, 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 I'm going to stop sharing, I think. Um, um, there we go. I'm going to stop sharing um, and I'll put it in the chat, but you can, we have a project email address um, and people can, uh, people can people send us emails and just say, I don't like this idea because of this or this idea because of that. Um, but, and that's, you know, bus network at septa.org or you can, you can email Wendy and Wendy can <laughs> send it to me. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to participate. Um, and, and but the the website has a lot of good information on it, so it's sort of worth going to, um, just just you know, if you're interested. And I think to that point, do you have any suggestions about how we can further reach, you know, the neighbors in your community? Do you have a municipal newsletter? Do you have a, like a social media presence? Like, are there ways that we could help to to get the word out? We would love mm -hmm. love your suggestions. To reach out with some of that information. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, yeah, I would absolutely want this, uh, you know, these outreach opportunities promoted weekly for a newsletter and on the website, on the Facebook page. So um, I think uh, Michelle Carroll from our office, who's been in touch with you all, mm -hmm. um, I'll have, um, coordinate with you all for any of that information, and we will absolutely get that out uh, to the public mm -hmm. every way we can. Thank you. Yes, I've I've been in touch with Michelle, so mm -hmm. definitely willing to continue to work with her to get the information out to the Narbra community. I also just wanted to briefly ask: it, Does anyone know um, Dennis Manley? Anyone know? So he he has led a group whose the acronym is Nice. And they have done a tremendous, tremendous job of um, doing landscaping and beautification at the Norbert Regional Rail Station. So I just wanted to give him a, a, a tremendous compliment for uh, all the work he's done. Uh, we've worked with him for a number of years. Uh, and by far, the Norbert Garden is one of the best in, in our whole network. So we appreciate that.
Great, thank you. We'll, we'll pass that along. I'm sure we'll go by the Thank you. So, sorry, just one more question and really coming with a lens for context of kind of transportation justice. Kelly, I, I thought you said that the bus, uh, the percentage of decline of ridership on the bus was 20%. So my two question is that, is that same 20% ridership decline seen on the R5 well, or the regional rail line? And then my next question is, what are the demographics of the riders? Do we see a different demographic on the bus versus the regional rail? Because quite honestly, that informs that survey I'm going to take. Who, who is accessing the different types of public transportation? And if we want to cut this short, that's fine. But I would ask perhaps that you follow up. Yeah, I mean, I can talk about that a little bit. I mean, the demographics of the, mo of the modes is, is, is very different. Um, the demographics of, of bus ri bus riders tend to be lower income. Bus riders tend to be, you know, persons of color. Um, regional rail riders tend to be more affluent. Um, I don't know. Ex I don't work on regional rail, so I don't know what's going on ridership wise. But um, I think regional rail is is still pretty down um, overall. I think a route like the forty four is a little different. It doesn't match the demographics to the rest of our bus system so much. It is typically more affluent and typically, um, you know, we have, there's fewer black riders, there's fewer um, lower income riders, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it, we can do a little more digging and follow up, but um, generally speaking, like the, the ridership on the 44, uh, like I said, at the, like at the beginning, like the, the 44 in terms of like ridership patterns has typically always mirrored more like a regional rail service. Um, it's always been very peak oriented, like 6 a.m. 6 to 9, you know, uh, 4 to 6. Um, and there's always been really low weekend ridership, um, much, much lower than, than many routes that run at, at, at similar frequencies. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think one is, um, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the R5 or the, the Paoli line, like, has the best uh, frequency of pretty much any regional rail line um, and the best ridership. So a lot of people are choosing regional rail and the the bus and regional rail to some degree compete with each other for, yeah, for riders i so. appreciate that and quite honestly you just confirmed kind of anecdotally my own observations but uh, you know i'm hesitant to cut off a public transportation line that allows people of color from communities to come enjoy our shops our restaurants mm -hmm. here. Uh, that adds a layer of consideration in my own assessment which is why i just wanted to ask that question no, that, that, that's fair. That's a good observation. And maybe we're missing something in the data. Yeah. And I just want to add two resources. Um, and I, I see we, there isn't a chat. Otherwise, I would. Yeah, I know. I, was looking for it I know. I was going to do that earlier with the feedback form. Um, but the, um, someone pointed out the, the route profiles that are on the Bus Revolution website. And we have the demographics for each route on there. And that's from our key cards mm -hmm. um, that we were linking so it doesn't represent 100% of the riders on that line because it doesn't include people who are paying cash. Mm -hmm. um, but we have demographics from based on our, our septic key. So that tells you about who's riding mm -hmm. the 44. And then if you're interested in how our, in our ridership recovery on our planning.septa.org website, we have a really great dashboard mm -hmm. that shows how our different, how ridership is coming back on our different modes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's updated each month so that's yeah. but yes regional rail is much slower to, to yeah return. all right um unless you think you have specific information relevant to narworth or important to narworth here um, i think uh appreciate your your time and uh answers to all of our questions and uh thanks very much Fred, Fred, just real fast um I, I travel on Montgomery Avenue almost every day going to and from work. And, and I got to say a loss of total service of the 44 line with no replacement, I think would really do a disservice to not a huge uh, population, but, uh, you know, not insubstantial either. People who regularly stand mm -hmm. at the are standing at the corner waiting for the buses. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I feel like that might be a, a significant loss. So. I don't think anybody wants us to lose our <laughs> public transportation service. So, uh, I think we're all feeling the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks all. Thanks for the time tonight, and thanks for inviting us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, we will now move to public comment. So uh, let's start in the room. I'll point if uh, at the beginning you can just say your name um, and your address. So um, let's start it back. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Steve Menard. I live at 216 Sabine in Harbor. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the council. I've done so by Zoom over some meetings of the past few months. This is my first opportunity in person, so thank you. Um, I wanted to reiterate um, a strong commitment of, of many in the community to maximize open space at the 201 Sabine property. Um, I think that open green space is what would best serve the community. And Mayor Deutsch earlier tonight referred to Narberth as an environmentally conscious community, which is absolutely right. And I think that currently, the green space in Narberth is a relatively low percentage of the entire area, and more green space would be environmentally conscious and serve to provide more open space uh, opportunities for uh, Narberth and Nearberth residents. And I know that um, the preferences for park corner to corner, that is certainly my preference. I understand there are proposals for a uh, new building once the old building is, is demolished. And if that is the route, I would only ask that the council consider that the footprint of any new building is significantly less than what is currently there, so that would maximize green space. And I know that what I'm saying today is repetitive from for things you've heard meeting after meeting after meeting. And I apologize for what may be tedious to you, but I think it serves to show the importance of the issue and our commitment to the issue. Uh, and it's also important to note that I, I have not seen anyone stand up at these meetings and take a contrary position. I've heard people uh, have different views on what may be included in new building, but no one's saying, no, we need less green space. We need more green space. Um, and finally, I know that some of what I'm asking right now may be addressed later tonight, and I apologize, but this is my opportunity. Uh, I just want to pose some questions. I want to know if it is the council's intention to commit to, commit to maximize open space and if there is new building, to make that relatively small, and I would ask that if there is a new building, is it the council's intention to limit that to community services or perhaps childcare, such as exists today, rather than expanding to any more commercial use? So uh, that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Carol Marie Scanlon, Tutu for Sabine. I ask if I can speak without a mask because um, the ADA Act. No. But we're really asking people to keep their masks. Then, through the accommodations through ADA, if I don't wear a mask, my oxygen saturation drops. No, that's, that's not how that works, so Carol Marie. You're going to have to leave the meeting if you can't wear a mask. Can I have time for my whole comment? It's a three-minute comment, but oxygenation levels so may change the timing slightly. We'll, we'll start your comment. We'll start your timer when you start to. Okay. Um, today's topic I have is community engagement versus public comment. And engagement is a key term. Community members want to engage, talk, ask questions, and have questions answered. We want to be validated and recognized. In 2019-2020, there were over 200 people that attended community engagement meetings for, uh, for 201 on Zoom and were able to share ideas and interact with, with the council. What was the outcome of those meetings? Fast forward into 2022, council is pressing forward with plans for the second largest open space in Robert without community engagement. You promised all the way that there would be lots of meetings, nothing would happen without public interaction, and when I've asked and asked with community engagement meetings would take place, we get no answer. Now at the last meeting, last workshop meeting, Bob Weisberg said there are monthly meetings where people can talk. But speaking to the three minute timer is not an opportunity to have dialogue to hear ideas, to exchange thoughts, plans, wishes. And when I tried to address Bob about the difference of public comment and engagement, Fred, you held your hand up and said, stop, your time to speak is over, which is exactly my point. Do you want to have a dialogue with the community? But wait, you did have a dialogue with the community about the reimagination of Station Circle. You had three meetings about Station Circle, but isn't the future of our second largest open space as important as a train station? I know you've been receiving emails because we've been receiving emails in support of the park. Are you reading the emails and are you going to read them in the public so that people can hear the support that this community has for open space for a park 
at Sabi. I can read them, you can read them. The question I have is, when are you going to have community engagement meetings where a community can get together and speak to you, interact with you, get questions answered, hear what we have to say? Because if you're not willing to have these community meetings, it would go back to a one, it would be a really, really sad state of affairs if the community had community meetings and invited you to that. Who's going to take the leadership role? Are we going to take the leadership? Are we going to take the leadership role? 30 seconds. Are you going to take the leadership role? Because speaking for 30 minutes, 33 minutes is not engaging. And where does it go? Not really anywhere. National Park Standards say a community with our size should have 39 acres of park, open space and park. We have eight. Narvati Top Green, we have a golden opportunity to make Sabine a park from corner to corner, increasing our green space Thank you, Carol. for the community, for the future of NARC. Thank you, so Carol. So no development on Sabine. Yes. I'll defer to the end and let the next person go. No, that's not all. I prefer to go in order. Okay. Great. If you could speak up a little. Sorry. I'm making a statement on behalf of the Parks and Recreation Board, which I am a member of. Although the Norbert Parks and Recreation Board advocates for additional recreational outlets for all Norbert <coughs> residents, the Norbert Parks and Recreation Board cannot recommend that Norbert Borough move forward with the skate park pilot program at this time. We thank the borough manager for responding to our questions, but without any assurances that important safety and maintenance measures will be implemented for the pilot program. The Parks and Recreation Board is unable to approve this project. We do strongly urge Norbert Borough Council to seek a legal opinion from the borough solicitor about the insurance policy, failures on site that may lead to a lack of coverage, and potential negligence claims that may affect Norbert Borough, council members, and taxpayers. If you do choose to proceed, we also recommend that the Borough Council consult with a skate park expert for feature placement and installation to ensure a safe experience for skaters of all ages. Members of the Parks and Recreation Board will not be present at these meetings as we plan to address other park businesses. Thank you, Parks and Recreation Board. Uh, now, as a uh, fellow resident, I agree with previous statements and while it's great that we do have that uh, resolution that you passed two years ago to preserve the open space that is not legally binding so I just urge whatever community vision uh, the borough council proceeds with that you look for opportunities to increase open space thanks thank you yes Sure. I'm going to echo some of the comments made already in regards to, I'm oh, sorry, Jim Spear, 321 Grayling Avenue. I'm going to echo some of the comments made already in support of increasing green space at 201 Sabine, and particularly in favor of tearing down the existing building and realizing a green park from corner to corner, I think is very realistic. We have the opportunity to more than double or even triple our green space at 201 Sabine. At the same time, the community engagement surveys of 2020 and 2021 identified lots of variety of community interests in things and activities and amenities that might happen at uh, 201 Sabine. Top, uh, top response independently was for childcare, for instance. There was also mentioned a home for the food bank, a home for the theater. Uh, people even mentioned pools, the um, a community pool. All things that don't necessarily fall under the heading of green open space. 
Um, I think there's more than enough room at that lot to realize a quarter to corner park and also uh, a smaller building, as I think Mr. Minard, I think? Yes, I'm sorry. I, that sounded great to me. As long as that footprint is, it seems like it could be a lot smaller than what exists now. So uh, I urge council and the residents to refresh themselves with the results of the, sur the survey. There were more than 435 responses to that time, which is significant and represents a significant Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Karen Bellamy. Um, my address is 231 Wayne Avenue, and I'm a lifelong Norwood resident, Jennifer Norwood. I've never attended nor publicly spoken at a bar meeting, but the future of 201 St. Vine is near and dear to my heart. Open space is at a premium in our densely populated arbor. It's a rare, rare commodity that we can't afford to offer to developers. I'm pleading with you to not only save the park, but to expand it to include all 3.7 acres from corner to corner, corner to preserve and protect all of Narbrook's parks from any development. Um, so the existing park includes a sloped perimeter with matured um, cherry trees. They absorb much of the noise and pollution from Montgomery Avenue's traffic, provides a beautiful visual screen from the vehicles that whiz by. Growing up in the 200 block of Woodbine Avenue, my sister and I didn't have much of a backyard behind our rock house, nor did anyone else in our close-knit neighborhood of Woodbine, Campton, Iona Avenues. But not having a grassy backyard to play in didn't deny us of any of the fun or put us in harm's way because we had a safe public place to play nearby the parks and grounds of the former Narva School. We could walk there to have a catch, to play on swings. You can have a picnic only blocks from home. Um, fast forwarding several decades, my own daughters experienced being enjoyment from playing at North at Sabine Park. And the best part is that it's not just for children. Young and old can be seen doing yoga, participating in other fitness activities outdoors, sitting on benches, to enjoy a middle of the day break from the indoors and community gardens for residents, regardless of how much or little land that they own to enjoy gardening, share that passion with others, grow fresh produce for themselves, give to others. So having Sabine Park and Narbrook Park in the borough is one of the reasons why Nars, like myself, chose to reside in Narbrook as adults. Please think about the future of Narbrook when making your decisions about 201 Sabine preserve and protect this essential, irreplaceable green space for future generations of ours. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, no comment, I'm not a resident. Uh, yep. Hello, my name is Peter Grove. I'm a retired science teacher, and I live at 25. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, along with Jim, I planted trees and dug tree holes in Narbeth and looked after the fauna by the lake for some years. And I've been working for two or three years on a stream restoration project in Narbeth. And I wanted to commend the, the councillors for working with lot three Elmwood, that's an amazing thing that you are really considering for preserving that. As for one on one Sabine, I think once again you are presented with an historic moment. And you are presented with a wonderful opportunity. Well, Mr. Shand, who was the original owner of that piece of land, who either sold or gave it to the borough, I don't know which. If he were alive, I am certain that he would vote for the preservation of the entire corner to corner 3.9 acre Sabine parcel. Because it was this same Alexander Shan who in 1926, and I learned this from Vicky Donahoe's history of Narbeth, saw and grabbed the opportunity to secure the Narbeth sports field 
when to all intents and purposes it looked to the whole world, the flat field would have become a railway depot. You heard earlier there are over 5,000 residents in Napa, and that number is growing. Numerous studies have shown that communities of that size should have close to 40 acres of open space, and we have eight. A park, a playground, a natural area, a mini nature preserve with a trail, some trees, some wild flowers, and this right in our borough. 30 seconds. Incredible. Please seize the opportunity. Yes, there will be expenses to the borough, but when the dust is, has settled, you will all be remembered and honored for generations to come. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on. Sure. So for people on Zoom, I currently have everyone uh, muted. So uh, if you just use the raise hand function on Zoom or turn your video on and literally raise your hand, I'll uh, call on you and then you'll see a prompt on your screen where you can unmute yourself and make comment. All right, looks like uh, our first person is uh, Lisa Saltzman. Hi, I just wanted to um, echo uh, our very eloquent neighbor who just spoke um, to say that I do think that this is a remarkable opportunity uh, to save and preserve green space in Narberth. I, two years ago at the community meetings that we had over the fall of 2020, was quite committed to the notion of preserving the building itself, doing the, the deferred maintenance on it, because I also thought that the food bank and the daycare were, were enterprises that we should support and were for the good of the community. But it sounds as if that is an ever evaporating possibility. So if, if the town, if the borough is no longer committed to thinking creatively in the way that Gigi, for example, proposed last month at the meeting about ways of partnering, getting federal funds, finding ways to maintain, reimagine that smaller footprint of the building as a site for the kind of services that are there. Um, I think if that is not a possibility, then the entire space should be um, reimagined as green space for the good of the community. And I'm strongly in opposition to any development, particularly of more condos or apartments and so forth. Um, in a town that doesn't need that and actually needs, or a borough that doesn't need that and actually does need green space. So I wanted to register my opposition to development, my sadness that it seems we've let go of the possibility of finding a way to preserve the functions of the food bank and the childcare, um, but I support um, green space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's Mary Kay Hamburger. Do you, do you still want to make a comment? Sure, I'm sorry. Just a quick comment. Hi, I'm Mary Kay Hamburger. I um, I live in Bryn Mawr, but I lived on um, uh, the 300 block of North Essex for quite some time. I'm the board member still of the Narberth Improvement and Cleanup Endeavor, and I just congruent with um, Ms. Wendy's comment um, when she presented for SEPTA, um, it, uh, you know, the NAR uh, NICE, the Narberth Improvement and Cleanup Endeavor is still working. We're in our 55th year in the borough um, doing a uh, cleanup and, and, um, and projects. And I just wanted to say thanks back to, I know they probably got off the call, but the folks from SEPTA have been great partners to NICE. Um, and are so wonderful to deal with when we're doing projects at the train station. Um, but if anybody in the public or in Narberth or that anybody that lives nearby wants to get involved, uh, just drop a line to nice.narberth at gmail.com and love to have you volunteer. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Kay. Yep. 
All right, I do not see um, anyone else on Zoom who's indicated they'd like to speak. All right. Um, wait, before we go on, um, Samantha, I believe Caroline Slama had a hand up. Uh, I didn't, Mayor, I, I didn't see that. She wants to raise her hand again. Um, uh, on my screen, it was just showing a hand up. Ms. Slama, you heard that? No, no comment. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on to agenda item 10, which is the consent agenda. Is the borough council for consent agenda to take Is there a second? Second. That's a lot of seconds. I think I heard Bob first, because he's next to me. <laughs> uh, is there any discussion? Uh, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, raise your hands. Yes. Okay. Uh, next item is a public hearing. I guess we'll adjourn the meeting and into this public hearing, which is on the proposed ordinance amending the Norbert for Ozone to create the Norbert Historic District overlay uh, and uh, fulfilling what has been discussed previously as the infill ordinance to allow for multiple principal dwellings on a property through additional use approval and creating different building types, including the college building type. I have a number of exhibits I will mark as this is a zoning ordinance amendment. First will be 4001, which is the ordinance uh, in consideration for approval at tonight's hearing. Board Exhibit 2 is the legal notice for tonight's hearing. Board Exhibit 3 is the proof of publication in the Mainline Times, which was published on May 1st and May 8th, 2022, uh, with that legal notice for tonight's hearing. Board Exhibit 4 is the proof of submission to the Montgomery County Law Library of the proposed ordinance, which was marked received by them on May 3rd, 2022, and availed for public inspection. Board Exhibit 5 is the proof of submission and subsequent review by the Montgomery County Planning Commission, uh, which was submitted to them on April 13th, 2022. Board Exhibit 6 is the proof of submission to the Narberth Planning Commission, which was submitted on April 13th. 2022, and that is the most recent version. It was uh, submitted previously on the prior renditions and discussed by the commission on February 17th, and there is a review letter for that, and then also again on May 5th, but the submission was on April 13th. Board Exhibit 7 is the proof of posting of the legal notice at 10 conspicuous locations uh, throughout the borough and around the borough that would be impacted by this zoning change as it is a uh, zoning overlay which mimics the current uh, historic district. Normally that isn't something that is done for the ordinance hearing, but since there is a map amendment as well, and it's a comprehensive map amendment, uh, there's required to be postings uh, of the areas that would be impacted by that map amendment. So those are the seven uh, exhibits uh, that are marked up, uh, or are marked uh, and will be admitted for tonight's hearing. Part of the record, the issues arise. Um, with that, I will turn it over to the public to see if there's any members of the public, uh, either in person or uh, online, that want to provide comment on this ordinance specifically. Is there anybody in the room? I see none in the room. Any online? Uh, anyone on Zoom, if you'd like to make a comment in regards to the proposed ordinance, uh, same procedure as before, please raise your hand physically or digitally. No one on Zoom mm -hmm. has the hand raise. Uh, this ordinance was discussed um, last month when it was a uh, motion for advertised. Uh, a lot of credit does go to the Norbert Planning Commission. I do see Mr. Speaker in the room today. We provide a lot of work and, and planning. Uh, as this is a pretty planning heavy ordinance, uh, it is a pretty, uh, fair to say, a unique ordinance, a progressive ordinance. Um, but it is an idea of preserving the uh, historic resources and but still allowing that prop those properties to be used uh, productively. Um, it will provide different options for the borough's consideration and review of land development projects and provide for a smaller uh, smaller opportunity for smaller constructions of opportunities to develop the borough through that new uh, cottage building type. Does council have any questions or comments regarding the ordinance? Yeah. So 
So there have been a lot of sort of questions from the public about some of the details about this. So I'm hoping that, assuming that uh, this already is passed, we can create a short summary and put it online so people are aware of what, their, uh, what the options are with this. Um, well, we'll at least make it available. So that, uh, I know, but I mean, I think we need a quick summary because people are going to keep asking. So. Sure. Uh, I would say that's something that could, I'm, I'll admit I'm not sure if that's the best approach, but if the majority of council wants us to do that, then, then I'll do that. I just think so many questions are going to be so specific to each property that I don't know if a general summary would be more harm than good. Um, I do think that, and I'm really grateful to the members of council who handled some of these public comments as well as our planning commission chair, uh, Mr. Grossi. Um, but I think that once council approves this ordinance, like we do with any other kind of zoning question, that uh, our uh, zoning officer, Mr. Kevin Walsh, should like answer people's questions on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure they're getting the best information. And I would also say that uh, the approval of any development be done most likely through a conditional use hearing uh, if there's a historic uh, resource on that already. So that would be another opportunity for council and the public uh, to be involved in, in that property uh, discussion if there was an application set forward. And that would obviously be, be advertised as well for, for the public uh, to know. Um, but I think the, the, the important thing to keep in mind is that the, this was carefully crafted in a way to affect properties that have significant land yet a historic resource already on it. Large enough uh, where there could potentially be development, particularly if someone wanted to tear down that historic resource and put multiple new dwellings on that property. The intent is to preserve the existing resource but still allow the existing property to be developed in a way that uh, isn't too crowded providing for smaller structures in that, providing for proper setbacks, and providing for proper streetscapes to keep that feel along the street, uh, while also maintaining the actual historic resource uh, in a historically, um, uh, with, with historic integrity. Uh, but it isn't a situation where anyone can tear down their house and build five houses on their lot because of, that's what the ordinance says, multiple principal dwellings. The, the intent is to keep that historic resource, but there are still Set setbacks and lot width requirements and, um, um, and the other um, requirements for this underlying zoning districts. Uh, and it does apply to 3A, 3B, and 3C zoning districts. That's an overlay. Thanks for the summary. Any other discussions? If there are no other questions uh, from the public or from council, uh, we will close this public hearing on the proposed uh, infill development ordinance and map amendment. Uh, this ordinance is now in position for council uh, for consideration, and uh, we will re-adjourn back into the public meeting and continue with the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Walter. All right, the next item on the agenda is 12A, which is the development uh, ordinance. Under the borough council, adopt ordinance 1045 for infill development. There a second? Second. Okay. Is there a discussion? We just got a great summary here. I've been saying the same thing every meeting. I'm just going to give it one more two sentence Hail Mary pitch that I think we've heard a lot of support from the community about transit oriented density. I have not had any community members say we're looking for interior density. I still hold that lawns and yards are a public commodity. And are valuable to everyone in that interior neighborhood and that we're solving a problem that I don't think we quite yet have I continue to ask has anyone come and say we really tied my hands with this historical preservation ordinance my plan was to do this and now I can't and the answer was no um, so I I continue to think that we should we should pause this um, until we we have seen how the historical preservation has played out and we have neighbors tell us we're looking for interior density because I haven't heard that. But, but there is an example. That's what inspired this whole thing. I, I wouldn't do it for one property. Well, you said there were no examples, and there is actually I mean, an example. And I would say, Cindy, that when we were considering the historic preservation ordinance, the number of people did make the case that they you know, wanted to develop their house. And yeah. they were going to
lose the ability to develop their house the way they wanted to. There were multiple uh, people who made that argument. Um, so I don't think it's it's novel. I think people have been complaining about it since we uh, brought up the ordinance. Basically what this does is restore a right these people had before the historic district ordinance was put into place. This is, I, I asked Todd that question very directly, the chair of the planning commission, because I really wanted to understand, is this a new thing? And I was like, really, no. With, with the historic district ordinance, it kind of limited what you could do if you had that really large lot. And so, so now this is just, and that was an unintended consequence of the historic district ordinance. This is just restoring a right they had before. And I totally resonate with your wish for green lawns or uh, wooded meadowland or whatever. Where, but I don't feel like I can say to a fellow homeowner in the borough, I'm sorry, you can't develop your property the way you want to because I want you to maintain that green space for me or for the borough. That just, that just feels like I'm I'm, I'm taking too much from them. So I, I'm comfortable with this because it isn't giving something new. It's restoring something that we unintentionally took away. Hi. A um, technical question for the Borough Solicitor. Would our, I mean, our existing impervious surface and building coverage percentages would be the same either way, correct? Correct. I don't believe yes. they're impacted by this ordinance. Yeah. But there's another thing I think that when we first saw this, it was a little bit more yes. pervasive, and we mm -hmm. discussed with the planning commission, and they narrowed it mm -hmm. to this yep. particular set that's here. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just like we had input into this process. Uh, right. So it, and and, and there was a compromise. Yeah. yeah. No. I think it's just I appreciate all of your opinions for sure. Appreciate and yours too. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Exactly. Is there any other discussion? Okay, well, we're voting on the ordinance for infill development. All those in favor, please raise your hands. All those opposed, motion passes. Six to one. <laughs> uh, 12B. Okay, so this, well, we should, we should open the discussion. Yeah. Uh, this is the three on one. So it's me again. Okay. Uh, I move that Borough Council adopt resolution 2022-13 for agreement of sale for three on the second. Second. Right. Samantha, Borough Council. Uh, actually, John. I'm happy to jump in. This uh, resolution is not going to be, uh, is not in a position for council support tonight. So I'd recommend that council table this ordinance to the June um, uh, business council meeting. That is not because of any hardships or animosities or changes of course uh, on this matter. Everything is staying the same. I think it's just a matter of going back and forth uh, with the the, um, the other party, the selling party, that, that the selling party still needs to figure out some issues on their end uh, regarding some timing. So everything that uh, has been discussed previously is still moving in that direction. See the original first draft of this agreement of sale, which was uh, posted. Um, you can see that that was not done. It was still a draft, and it still remains in that draft form. The borough is waiting to hear back comments um, from the sellers and their attorney. We expect to get that back within short term, so it should be well within a position uh, if it is able to be proceeded with at, at that June meeting. Uh, by tabling, tabling it, it would appear on the agenda uh, at the next meeting automatically. I would move that we table consideration of resolution 2022-15. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor of, of table. discussion. Okay. Motion is tabled. Sorry. Some of these there's no discussion on it. Yeah, exactly. We don't need to talk about that. Um, all right. 12C. Okay. I move that council um, advertise the ordinance for municipal towing and municipal owned parking. Second. Second. Second about. Westport. All right. Discussion. Mr. Walker and Durant, would one of you like to? Sure. 
So the goal of this board then is, um, you know, even just the year that I've been here, a little bit of a bugaboo, and I'm sure for many people in the community on council, it's probably been one for even longer. And it's right now with our borough parking lots here at 100 Conway and at 201 Stay by. Uh, parking is kind of a free-for-all situation, and the borough really has no control over it. And unfortunately, that's led to a situation where people have realized this and have been encouraged to basically just leave vehicles indefinitely in our parking areas. And the real challenge with that is it denies the public access to those parking areas, especially here at the parking lot at 100 Conway, which services this building, our park, our library, our other community spaces at 80 Windsor. And so my goal with this ordinance, and I really appreciate all the feedback and development from the uh, ad hoc parking committee and from uh, Solicitor Walco and from uh, Chief Gallagher on this, is to give the borough a mechanism to do something about it. And this ordinance will give us the power um, you know, to ticket and tow um, if people are in violation of this ordinance. Uh, in addition, it would give council the option, if it's so desired, to create some sort of permit program um, for long-term parking um, most notably at 201 Sabine, there currently is what appears to be excess parking. So if council wanted to move in that direction or allow some kind of um, permit parking there, this ordinance would give us the option to. It's not saying that we would have to, but it would give us that option. Um, but the most important part is it would give the borough the power to um, to get rid of any you know vehicles that have um, you know, been parked in our uh, public parking lots. Uh, and what is it they shouldn't be? Uh, the, I guess the other thing I would say too is that it, it puts rules around how towing can be done in the borough. Apparently we didn't have any of that really codified. No, not codified. Yeah. So it is an extensive provision related to towing. Uh, it is something that is also uh, that they have in Lower Marion County for some of our neighboring municipalities, but it's, it's necessary in order to provide no assurances that if the borough is arranging for towing and storing that we have the right companies that are doing that for, for the public's benefit and, and the when that is done uh, should not be anything different um, than, than what the police are doing right now for abandoned vehicles or wrecked vehicles or you know, vehicles that are, are posing a public safety we just we're trying to make sure that we know who is towing where your vehicles are and if those are, are the right companies I want to make a really important clarification for the public. This would only impact borough towing yes. services. Yes. So if you have your own accord, maybe a tower, it's still you just kind of you know do whatever you want. These regulations are only for towers providing service to the borough. Sorry, thank you. Any other uh, questions or discussion? Happy to say this finally coming to pass. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think it's it's always embarrassing to walk by and see those. And I know members of the public have spoken out as well, so it would be good to deal with these uh, eyesores. Okay, so uh, the motion is to advertise, uh, sorry, the motion is to, yeah, to advertise the ordinance for municipal towing and municipal owned parking. All those in favor? Okay, yes. Next is building codes. I, I move that Borough Council approve advertisement ordinance to update building codes from 2015 to 2018. Is there a second? Second. Michelle? Discussion? Um, I, I would just share that this, this came out of our committee because we were looking for ways to strengthen um, green standards with the new construction. And there are there are some green codes that are really progressive, but they're but we're not permitted, is my understanding, to adopt those because they exceed what the state would allow. So I think this is what we can do. And, and this is what's recommended uh, and should be required for all municipalities. The, the background of it is that um, the majority of municipalities in Pennsylvania. Have, adopt, uh, have opted into adopting the Pennsylvania Uniform Construction Code. There are some changes here or there. Narva Thoreau has done that, and when you do that, you cannot exceed those requirements that have been approved um, by uh, up pursuant to the 
Construction Code Act of Pennsylvania. Previously, Pennsylvania has adopted the 2015 uh, Uniform Construction Codes, and at that point in time, Norbert Burrow and all the municipalities adopted the 2015 codes. Maybe some different codes, because there's a number of construction codes out there, you know, the electricity codes, the uh, wildland urban interface code, the uh, gas, fuel gas code, plumbing code, all these different codes. Uh, it's now recommended to do the 2018, and we're going to adopt the 2018 uh, if council sees fit. Um, that is the recommendation of the uh, fire marshal and the building inspector, uh, and is what's being done to the as well. So simply just updates from 2015 to 2018, and any standards that have changed in the interim on these codes. Further discussion? Okay, uh, the motion is to advertise the ordinance to update the Robert building codes from 2015 to 2018. All those in favor? Okay, yes. All right, 12E, Speed Park. Um, I move that Borough Council approves <coughs> final rules for the skate park pilot, uh, approves the proposed layout for the skate park pilot, approves maintenance and operations plan as a in the packet for the skate park pilot, approves the opening date and the marketing plan for the skate park pilot, and approves the skate park survey. Is there a second? A second? Lot yeah. yeah. <laughs> Discussion. <laughs> so, uh, so I, um, I organized the agenda the way I did to maybe take this discussion in manageable uh, chunks. Um, so the first item that council needs to consider are the rules for the skate park. Um, so I took the um, discussion from council um, at our last meeting and updated the rules to reflect that. I added the um, park hours that we talked about. Um, I think there was some discussion about not having people use the um, area when there's inclement weather. So I added language about not to use it when it's ice or wet out. And then um, finally, um, I added language to it. Um, oh, what was the third thing we talked about? Um, I added uh, uh, one other additional rule what, to what, Was it that you can't move the uh, structures? Move the, uh, thank you, Mayor. That you can't move the, um, the equipment. And I double checked it to the extra shirt, and we already have the Radnor rules. Uh, I also got the ASTM uh, model skate park rules. And so I looked at those, and our rules are pretty consistent with those as well. Um, so, um, so that is where the rules that you have before you came from. Reminds me of the ASTM stands for. Well, oh boy. Sorry, we have yeah. it's testing. in the memo. Testing manufacturing. American yeah. Society for Testing and Materials. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So these are safety experts. Yes. Okay. Uh, so anyone have any comments about the rules? <laughs> Well, I mean, one of the rules I believe is in there, I'm sorry if I don't remember exactly, but basically the, the borough has the right to, you know, close the park at any moment. Yeah, if, that was another change. That if, is if, 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 it, if it's deemed, that, that gives us, good, if there's some unexpected circumstance going on, we don't have to say, well, you know, it wasn't I think it wasn't I see, well, we don't think it's safe, we're closing it. Yeah, originally that language was listed some specific reasons why we might close it, and then yeah. I remember council had said instead of saying specific reasons, just say we can close it whenever we want. Okay. Because it is a pilot, so yeah. mm -hmm. it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen. I don't see any other. Well, I mean, it was about that, but did you yeah, we'll move on right? to the next item. Yeah. Let's see any other concerns about the, the rules. So let's move to. Uh, Layout. Sure. So, uh, updated, uh, included in the packet on a Monday afternoon is the uh, proposed layout. Uh, myself and the uh, council vice president and our uh, public works manager uh, had an opportunity to uh, chat further with uh, Jesse Clayton and, uh, and Mr. Uh, David Bordeaux about uh, some of the layout. Um, I have a lot of thanks to our vice president who introduced me to uh, SketchUp which was used to make this 3D model. We got a little bit of a chicken and egg where understandably, well, Public Works was concerned about assembling the equipment then having to move it, and Mr. Clayton was concerned about um, 
you know, not being able to see the equipment set up and make a recommendation on its location. So in SketchUp, uh, we made, um, well not we to be fair, our council vice president made a, an exact uh, replica of the uh, court and the equipment and we were able to work um, with Mr. Clayton and the others on the call to uh, design the layout that was uh, you know, determined here. Uh, in addition, again, I looked at the ASTM um, you know, regulations on uh, various things about how the equipment should work that I referenced in the memo to council and this layout is uh, compliant with the ASTM recommendations um, as well as the advice from uh, Mr. Clayton. Um, so I just want to check and see here tonight. We do have to submit this layout to um, our liability insurer and our workers' comp insurer for, um, for approval as well, but I needed council's approval before doing that. So just to, to cl clarify that a bit, so we've checked with the, the safety standards from the ASTM. We've consulted with a professional designer of skate parks on the way up. And we're furthermore gonna have this looked at by our insurance companies, all of which will make sure that it's safe. Yes. Is that accurate? And that will include an on-site um, inspection as well. Okay. Uh, I, well, I appreciate you saying I've been on council to look at this. Just to kind of underscore the list you just rattled off, I don't want to suggest it's not even appropriate for council to, to comment on the placement of that because you just listed all the experts that signed off safety. I mean, I know I, I certainly <laughs> would go against the national safety off. standards. <laughs> we're signing uh, off with these steps we're taking. Well, I'm going to say thank you for <laughs> checking all those boxes, <laughs> and I certainly don't have the expertise to comment. Me neither. Uh, <laughs> all right. right. So I just wanted to uh, emphasize the point that we're not going to, even though we may vote for this tonight, we're not going to open the park until we have that insurance inspection after the equipment is put in place, right? Because yeah, I was going to talk a little more about that okay, the yeah, opening date. Yeah. Okay, well then I'll, I can wait. Okay. okay. Any other comments on the speaker? Leo. All right. Uh, thanks for uh, yes. again for all the work with the three D printer. It's it definitely, fun. I think, made it a lot easier. Than it's fun. Other segments. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maintenance and operation. Sure, so in the memo, um, again, I provided some information on that. I borrowed a lot, admittedly, from the memo that our council vice president and chair of infrastructure committee um, provided previously that goes through the pains we have taken to ensure in a safe environment for the, um, for the skate park. The work that's been done so far and will be done prior to opening to ensure a um, safe equipment and safe surface for the skate park. And then there's also a plan in the memo for um, weekly uh, inspection by our public works team to ensure that the equipment and the surface remains in a condition that's safe and usable for participants of the um, skate park. And again, this plan is going to have to be um, reviewed and approved by our uh, liability and workers' comp insurers. And if I could speak up. Uh, as the borough solicitor, it would be my opinion that as long as the liability insurers are okay with that plan, and obviously the borough sticks to that plan, there, there should be no liability issues for the borough. Okay. Any other discussion on this? All right. Uh, so is that a question? Oh, no, I'm sorry. That was one of the questions. Do you approve? And I just heard you saying you approve. Again, it, it's... Yes, I mean, as long as it's done yeah, with the plan and, yep. and the, the liability carrier there, um, you know, then at, at that point it's no different than the playground. Essentially. You, know, sure. you can get hurt on the playground, and if you don't maintain your playground equipment correctly, it's an issue. Yeah. I see no difference in the That's a good, actually kind of an important point. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, Mr. Clayton. So originally an opening date of um, May uh, 27th was discussed. While I certainly think the equipment and the um, surface could be prepared by that time, I can't, I'm not gonna say that we can't do it, but I can't guarantee that our insurer will have the opportunity to do the inspection prior to that date uh, and, and then secure the um, underwriting for the coverage. So um, I do think that we may wanna consider 
pushing that out to June, uh, that Friday, June 3rd, um, in order to ensure that those coverages, ensure that, you know, again, that we've done everything we need to do for safety and maintenance, and then we have that coverage in place before we open it up to the public. Okay. Other events on June 4th? No, no. Okay, next week okay. And that might work out better too in the sense of who knows how many people will be away from Memorial Day weekend and that sort of thing. Yeah. That's good. All right, does uh, anyone have objections to moving the date? No, no, no. All right, do you have another comment? Well, yeah, about, about this. I mean, I think that, like, this is, as you pointed out, this is a critical piece. We have to have them. And I think it was like, it was actually sort of somewhat of a, of um, uh, uh, we didn't think of, we realized like that actually we want this inspected after it's in place, not like I mean with all due respect to your SketchUp, not, not off of the a drawing or you know looking at the equipment, but actually with the stuff in place because then they're really evaluating the actual you know layout that we have, the conditions, the way they fixed up the concrete, all that stuff. They can look at it all in place before we just like before you would open a building you know you have an inspection before you open it with everything done not they don't inspect of course they also look at the drawings but now that we're really looking at so i think that's critical i mean anything we do has to be contingent of course on that all right um in terms of the um, marketing plan um, I want to just give a thanks to uh, Harry Quake, who's had a lot of great ideas on that already that he sent to myself and, and a couple other um, folks. And um, again, I think it's something where um, you know any outside support the borough can get in promoting it, I'm certainly very grateful and happy to have. Um, so I mean, if council is comfortable with some of that work being outsourced to members of the community, uh, I think that would be to the good of everyone. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to end up with like signs everywhere and stickers everywhere because I know some people are very enthusiastic and they have stickers already. So we may want to make a suggestion about that if we don't want the stickers everywhere. That's a good point. Yeah, I think it's somewhere I would still have some oversight over it. It's just, you know, I wouldn't have to, myself and for staff wouldn't actually have to okay. physically do it. Yeah. I think it would all have to be pre approved by, um, by myself before anything. Sounds great. It's great that we have enthusiastic uh, support from the community. So, right. All right, and then the um, the last item that I prepared here, and keep in mind, I'm I'm not I've never skateboarded in my life, so um, the survey here just comes from the perspective of someone who's imagining what someone skateboarding uh, might want to tell us about the pilot. Um, so I did send it as well to Mr. Um, Bordeaux for um, for comment. Um, I don't think he's had an opportunity to provide that comment yet. Um, if there's any perspectives or advice from members of council about if any possible changes to the survey, um, you know, I, I'm certainly open to that. And again, it's something that I would want to do, have ready as soon as opening um, day for it. And again, it'd be something where we would have a QR code as well as a um, link for people, you know, posted around the um, skate park along the rules. So that people could just very easily, while they're at the skate park, could, um, could do it. So my recommendation would be to include an email address just to you know, yeah. make it so that you can make one submission. Otherwise, you open yourself up to a lot of right. submissions by the same person. <laughs> I, but yes, we will do that. I also will note just um, having done a lot of online surveys in other places before, um, something I will share, and I think it's good for the public to know this as well as council. Um, one of the other tools at our disposal is collecting the IP addresses of anyone who um, submits a survey response. Now that's not foolproof because if someone's on a cell phone, their service has different IP addresses, but you can, there's a lot of ways we can figure out if people are stuffing the box, so to say. All right. I'm trusting to take care of that. Any other comments on the survey? All right, uh, that's everything on our skate park list. So are there any other general comments or things that we haven't addressed? So. I'm sorry, is there some place where, I should know this, but 
out on the committee, but what the length of the pilot is? We haven't, uh, we haven't really specified that. I think okay. we should probably do that. I think, uh, we had a discussion earlier, you know, we had envisioned starting earlier in the year, originally. Um, we had envisioned probably being further along on our master parks plan. Maybe until we get like a savings times ends or something like that. You mean for this year? Like, yeah, for this year. Park. I mean, you, you don't mean like the lock the park up and making it accessible for no. the year, like. The, but like, when is this? When are we gonna? When is, it, is this? This was a pilot, right? So yeah. Like, I mean, when is the pilot? In, in theory, it could it could continue pick up again next spring, depending on how Master Parks planning is going. I have no idea. Okay, so it's so we have to question right again. Right. And when when would the when would it close in the fall? But that's so that's what you're getting. At. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would think I would ask. I mean, I would honestly just ask. Or state board community when, yeah. when, when, you know, when, when, yeah, when nothing else you can say when the, just sort of like, when, it's, uh, of course, they're, they're changing that, but like right now, when daylight savings time is ended, what's the date on that? It's usually yeah, October. October. So, so, may I make a suggestion? As a council member, I would be comfortable if the infrastructure committee wants to just be monitoring the situation and then make a recommendation to council if it's time to close the pilot or, or if it's. Or you know, it's going well. Just, just. So we don't have to decide just, right now. Yeah, well, that way, the, I mean, the committee can just kind of. That's my recommendations. The committee would just watch to monitor its use and appropriateness. That's fair. Yeah, that's yeah. I would okay. say, um, you know, uh, with deference to our infrastructure chair, we do have an existing uh, spot on the agenda for borough projects. And it's my intention that the skate park would be one of the listed borough projects that I would report uh, monthly on to the infrastructure committee. I'm just trying to avoid surprises where someone expected it to stay open and then we closed it because, you know. Yeah, I think so the topic's been raised. We don't have to. Yeah. So. I think the general expectation is maybe October, November, as we say. Okay. But let's, let's see how it goes. Okay. All right. Any other um, general discussion items on the skate park? All right. So we have a motion to uh, for final rule, maintenance and operation plan, open to date marketing plan, and our survey to move forward with all of those. Yeah, open to date to include with all of it with the contingent and approval mm -hmm. sure of the written documents as well as the final inspection of the park has installed. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, all those in favor of the for the skate park, for the stipulations. Skate park pilots. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's make a general comment. I just wanted to make a general comment following the vote, just that um, th this is a rare kind of project, at least it's rare in my experience of living as a resident of Niagara, to see a project like this kind of that emerged out of like the neighborhood itself and like out of discussions that went on for, for many, many many, many years. I know that going even going back into the early 2000s, maybe into the late 90s, there were people who wanted a skate park, and that idea persisted for a long time. And then I, and then through like the effort of a lot of volunteer residents, the equipment appeared, it arrived, the, 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 board, the, park, the park board, the rec, rec board, like asked the council to consider it. I'm give a shout out to Mary Kay. So and it's to Mary Kay, she, she actually to Mary Kay brought the idea originally, and it kind of it became reality. And I, I just think, and, and through a hand over hand, a lot of people's hands have touched this and helped and made it possible. And obviously, most recently, our borough manager. But um, I just think it's a pretty extraordinary accomplishment, and I just want to. You know, I'm proud of the, the council for being able to make it happen. It's, it's sick. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be lost on anybody who doesn't know, but that was his name is Henry. Henry? Harry. Yeah, Harry. Harry is 12 years old. I know. Yeah, Harry's 12. Oh, to the 12 year old kid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I thought Harry was a 50 year old resident because Harry had done <laughs> due diligence. Harry had checked the blizzard. David Bordeaux said, Well, I don't know if Harry can come to this. I said, Well, what do you mean? He's 12. I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was retired. <laughs> he had work, and David Verdun will credit him. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. All right. I do. <laughs> I love, it. love it. All right. That's, uh, that's all of our action items. Um, the information items. Uh, the reports have been filed. 
Do you want to give us the bridge update? Um, I mean, I guess I'm happy to answer questions about the report. So I wasn't prepared to okay. speak on it. Let me just thank you for what you're doing to keep this on track. You're doing a lot, and you know, it's not. I know it's not pleasant for you. Yeah. But I mean, I think I think it was clear from your latest memo that like Pannoni is aware that like we're not like we're not thrilled with the progress. Yeah. So I guess what it was that um, <laughs> is I had a um, meeting with our bridge engineer and the uh, borough engineer uh, last Friday to emphasize that you know delays, any further delays on the project are not going to be tolerated um, by borough council. Um, the good news is we're still, or at least in my opinion, I'm going to recommend the borough council if they're not going to be tolerated. And um, right now the let date is still uh, December uh, 6th, December 7th, I believe. And um, I have assurances from Benoni that that date uh, is not going to change. And uh, I you know, told them that that is very important to, uh, to myself and, and I'm sure it's important to council as well. Sorry to put you on the spot, but I felt that uh, that was yeah. worth, uh, reiterating it. December seventh is my birthday, so I'm really like to have this come out. Uh, uh, don't, don't expect personally it. meaningful to me. Yeah. Uh, I'll take don't, it. I'll take it personally if it's not. Don't expect yeah. actual yeah. construction just right. No, 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 no. no. We, we, have, get um, we get it. Two uh, two relatively major milestones coming up. Um, so in three weeks. Uh, Pannoni is supposed to submit the final uh, design plan to uh, PennDOT for uh, review. And then at next week's uh, infrastructure committee meeting, we're going to start the process to uh, select a construction inspector for the project. So. Okay, so we do have some, we do still have some items here. So, uh, for new business, we have. I, I'm oh, sorry. sorry, I have a question about information items. Um, the, yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I saw Mr. Elton's public work report that um, public works responded after hours to a sewer line block that was caused by cooking grease. Um, I suppose this is more of an f and question, but I'm wondering if the person who poured the cooking grease down reimbursed the borough for those after hours. Of, of, thankfully, they were able to unclog that line. Uh, they did not. That is um, not... Uh, not usually how that sort of thing works, um, but I'll, I'll just say they did not. And I'll also note that it was a um, it was a residential property where this occurred. So we should probably do some public education that you don't pour cooking grease. Yeah. I'll bring back my feet to buy it. I know. Oh my God. This, this is my moment. This I just public education. I tried to feed the barrel program like four years ago. I have a five gallon jug of used cooking oil in the garage that I don't Okay, because now you can't tell what you think about All right, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> totally appropriate to discuss the monthly reports. Any other? Okay. Seeing no further discussion on the monthly reports, um, let's move to the uh, 205 Grayling Zoning Hearing Board application. Yeah, so at least my recommendation on this one is that uh, I think this is one where I, I, I mean, I fully trust the zoning hearing board on any application, but I think this is one where I think it can solely be left to them, and I don't think they need any input from borough council on this one. Okay. All right. Uh, I see no disagreement on council. Okay. No approach. All right, old business. We have. Uh, 201 state bias update. Sure. So I don't I don't have a ton to lend share, but I do have one good you know one important thing to share. Um, so I had an opportunity to chat with um, HR and A uh, the other day, and I think they might be uh, someone who could provide a scope of services that might be realistic for borough council uh, to consider. So they've been asked to draft up a, a scope of work. Um, for uh, you know the request we have out there for option four, uh, once they have that and I have an opportunity to review it and everything kind of seems uh, appropriate there, um, we'll have them come and speak to borough council. And uh, once they've done that, you'll see uh, presentations from uh, HRT, uh, you know, not directly related to one state line, but in the past you've had a chance to hear from them. Uh, you've heard from the county redevelopment authority. 
And I hope that after hearing from HRA, council will have a better uh, sense of, of how or, uh, or if it wants you know, to pursue anything regarding option four. Um, the um, other thing I'll note is I did look at what some other municipalities have tried to do with similar projects and what sort of uh, planner they've used. And um, you know, looking at those firms, I didn't think they would be the right fit um, for this project. Um, but you know, I said once we get the proposal from HRA, council would have three um, firms to consider uh, working with to do a non-binding um, RFP uh, for the property. And and I would recommend in favor of doing it, um, just so we at least know what our options are. And that way, when council does, you know, have to make a definitive decision on the property, you'll know what you're actually deciding between. Because option four, to me, feels, you know, still feels very much kind of like a mystery uh, door of sorts. Within the parameters, I do want to emphasize, you know, of the resolution council passed, where even under option four, the existing open space would remain the same or would be expanded. And I think. You know, I think there is a lot of opportunity, even under option four, for the open space to be expanded. But again, those are things we won't know for sure unless we work with someone to, you know, help us fill in that information gap. Um, Mr. So, I just would like to bring us back to the survey that was done in December of 2021, and looking at the spreadsheet that had the raw data, I think there were like 360 respondents, which is really pretty good for a survey in a town our size. There were three top choices listed. The first one was to use some or all of the property for open space. That was 257 people said, I want that. You were allowed to pick more than one, so this is going to add 360. The second one was to use some, the second most important thing, was to use some or all of the space for indoor public space. 145 respondents chose that. The third was to preserve the existing daycare and community nonprofit uses. That was 116 people. So I, right now I feel like we're really addressing the first and the third of those things. We're not really addressing using some or all of the space, and I wouldn't say all, because I would never say that, for inter-public space, it would be ridiculous to building, but I would like to use some, you know, like to consider that we use some of that for inter-public space. And so what my hope is, is that when we make a decision about someone to help us through this process, someone with more professional expertise than any of us at this table has or anybody can expect us to have, that we won't keep our options so narrow that we will say we'd like to learn what is possible in using this space, including, you know, submitting these, as many of these three main goals as we can. Um, I just feel like we don't know what we don't know yet. And that's why, you know, we would go to someone who has professional expertise. They can let us know whether that's even possible or is it a pipe dream. And so I, I just would ask that we keep that in mind as we continue down the road on this. I would offer a slightly different perspective, which is that I, I see options one and two as being variations on creating public space, right? whether it's outdoor recreational or indoor community. So it's public space. Option three was not does not necessarily involve a phrase, really not something that aims at of the public space, right? It aims at the preservation of uses that were not, they're, they're public serving, but they're not public spaces, right? right? And so, in a sense, there's no flexibility, for example, to, to address the community's desire to keep that child care, right? Just keep that here sort of at a later time. Right, you tear the building down unless they have a facility in Narbor that we. Right. So the, the only way to address that is sort of on, on the leading edge of the project. Sure. If so, and, and it either is feasible and it makes sense for us because it returns rent revenue to, to replace what we're going to lose and it, and it keeps that institution and it makes sense. 
in it and it doesn't consume more of the lot than we're willing to consider, right, if it's a small portion. Like either that works or it doesn't. And so if it works, then you've got the rest of the space to play in, right? Right. And so at that point, I think it makes sense as part of the master parks planning process to say, should our parks also include some indoor recreational space to supplement the outdoor recreational space? And, and I guess I'm, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of, okay, so does that mean that we would, if, if that played out, we built the daycare center building. Or we would build. We would, yes. The daycare center building would be built, the rest of the property would be developed into parks, and then once the master park plan was done, we would then maybe build an indoor, have an indoor public space built? Are you saying? I think when, it, when you say the rest of the property would be built into parks, I mean, I think the bid we had, the, the estimate we have from Karen right now is basically for, you know, Environmental remediation, right. demolition, and just restoration of the site to, to grass. I know. So what, the, I'm, so, to the slope, you know, the, the, the grading in grass, right? Right. What we do with the property once it's mostly, you know, grass, like the next step, how we can you know, park and be finished, and how we can be done pursuant to the master parks plan. So, now we do it. Okay. Place, right? so, I mean, so, you're suggest so see, now this is not something that I had thought the master parks plan would address indoor public space. But if you're suggesting that is part of that, then that's great. Put it. I mean, I, I don't see why it would. Be. I, I, that just never occurred to me. Place. To me, parks is outdoor. Well, I mean, the, any park I can think of, it probably has indoor spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Not all of them. I'd also well, like to offer a perspective that once you have land, right, mm -hmm. at some point, future generations might decide that they have a need for more indoor public. I mean, but we might and decide so, that right now too. Well, we we that would happen that. Through, but that would happen through a, an engagement planning process. I mean, and I and I guess I I said see I guess I appreciate Michelle the distinction yes. you made between public amenity and the like, current private use that really we may have one opportunity to if, if we don't we don't act on that whatever if we don't have an opportunity to act on that we we would have that. Space, yeah. which which I guess I see. You know, I think there's a lot to discuss there, but I don't see it's closing any doors. Okay. See, it felt to me like we closed that door, and I was like, oh, I'm not ready to close that door yet, because I think we should think about that. I agree. We we might have we might decide we want indoor space in a way that we currently don't have in any of our. Right. I I mean I wouldn't buildings. feel prepared to know what what. Should, what it should contain, how big it should be, how it should be configured, because all we got was sort of general feedback, like this right. general goals of exactly. the community. And in order to shape that, yeah. it would require much more yeah. intensive process and a lot more community engagement. Mm -hmm. no, this this is really I, cool. I, 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 I thought we were down to just to option one or option four, and that's it, and we're not going to consider I think it's like anything a, else. And I guess I pictured option four meaning. It's a decision tree. Yeah. Like this, and I, this is like a prior. Yeah. An initial decision that needs to get made, but with respect to whatever, yeah. what public spaces we end up having, we end up having access to, then I think that further planning mm -hmm. decision should include consideration of exactly what you said, because it clearly was important. Uh, yeah, I when I went back and looked at, I had remembered that the second and third things were reversed and the care came before the indoor public space. I was like, wow, that's interesting. Okay, I forgot that. So, yeah, I feel like we can't let that go. Yeah, Thank mean, you. I mean, but there's one other thing to keep in mind with all of this, and it is, you know, how the finances of this is all going to work. Of course. Because that's what's going to drive it. But, and, and, well, <laughs> and, that, and that's the thing where I feel like we don't know yet what we don't know because we don't know what grants might be out there to do some of the things right. that we might want to do. That's, you know, there's a whole, there's, there's people who that's all they do is know what grants are. Yeah, right. so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We want that. All right. So, Thank does you. anyone have any concerns with um, Samantha's suggestion to talk to the uh, uh, consultant, the H HRNA? H H H HRNA. Yeah. You Did you get any, any indication of when they were providing a fee scope and service and fee? I have not heard anything since um, since the meeting. Um, so I need to need to be a follow up with them. Yeah. Well, I also want to get some feedback from council. Council, 
All right. Um, and just, just as a general note, Michelle, since you were the one who worked on the options, all the options currently under consideration involve expanding the green space. Oh, massively. Yeah. Just want to make that clear that <laughs> what the things we are considering all involve yeah. more green space than this current. Way more. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think option four would really only be reasonable if it probably much triple the existing, I mean, kept the, the existing like playground and probably just tripled the you know, like green space. I don't, it's a larger lot than you sometimes think because it's sort of covered by these spread out buildings in this parking lot, but if you can really think about how much room is there, you know, more than triple. I think it's more than triple. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to be conservative, yeah. but yeah, it could be more than triple. Yeah. But I, want to, I mean, the one thing I think at that least, I kind of noticed, noticed with a lot of the feedback we've gotten, is that people seemed okay if we were keeping the small building, which would have increased the open space. But I'm not sure that it would have increased the open space all that much more than what you're talking about. No. It's probably comparable. So it, it's just it's just kind of ironic to me that yes. people were good with that. But okay, well, I think it's hard to it's hard to visualize. It is. That's why I really loved your picture that you gave us of the looking down on the property and showed us how much is not open space right now. It's like there's hardly any open space really. Because we can do a lot better. Yes. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to uh, 15B, the master park plan ad hoc committee. Sure. So um, in your packet is a memo. Uh, our last meeting council asked me to give some thought as to realistic uh, timing um, for the work of this committee and its formation. Um, I think probably our goal should be, you know, sometime in the fall to really get the committee formed, and then you know, um, you know, at, at the beginning of 2023, really be in a position to really work on the master park plan, with the goal being to have a plan approved in time for grant applications starting at the beginning of 2024. And if we get sticker shock at the cost of planning, we'll see that we can get some grants. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, does anyone have any concerns about timeline? Okay, that sounds good. Uh, that's it for old business. Uh, Do we want to um, determine how the ad hoc committee uh, mm. Initial description is going to be formulated and described with the scope of work. Is that something that you want to take to the Do you want? Yeah, no, I can. I'll put some together and uh, we'll present that to Borough Council um, before, you know, we'll figure out when we want to start soliciting applications. Or, sorry, we won't solicit applications, but as we talked about last time, but um, we can talk and figure out when and how Council make the appointments mm -hmm. to that committee. Okay. Okay. Uh, comments for the good council. I know the Penn Valley Civic Association is having an event at the uh, Staples parking lot on Saturday with uh, street vendors and arts and uh, activities. Uh, one lot they're trying to revitalize that corridor. Montgomery Avenue, so just outside of Arbor. Uh, Mr. Softy Truck will be there. I promise. So I'll, I'll bring my daughter. Uh, it's Saturday, I think it's something like 11 to 4, it's uh, this Saturday. This Saturday. Mm -hmm. And Fred, we all just got an email from the superintendent of Cali moved to high transmission, mm -hmm. so masking is now required in schools tomorrow for all of the Yeah, okay, so Laura Marion School is good parents. Uh, yeah, is it mandatory masking? I don't know. I mean, we didn't specify beyond moderate. I don't think we anticipated moving beyond moderate transmission. No, but I meant like we need to have a masking ordinance again. So we set a rule that masks would be required in Borough Hall or in any meetings in Borough Hall if transmission were moderate or higher. Yeah, so yeah. right now, that's the rule that's in place. Um, I think I was so, asking about. General masking. I, I don't know how. You know, for places bringing it back into life. I think there's some stores, and maybe that's something that the mayor and the chief can just remind business owners if they choose 
to require so masks, and that's an issue fine. to call in. I mean, that's, that's probably that's already right. Yeah. Yeah. right. I think that's what we. I'd be happy to remind you that we don't shop owners. Okay, so shop just uh, be ready. If, you know, store. I know some no, we're, we're, I mean, we handle it on a case by case basis. It's usually a the proprietor if they, you know, they can. It certainly either if they want somebody to leave the store for, you know, X reason for something like that. We handle those things on a case by case basis. You know, we've actually, believe it or not, we've still had uh, situations like that presented to us uh, during the past year. Not surprising at all. We all enjoy our lovely outdoor dining. Uh, it is pretty good. Relief that's happening. Yeah. Uh, Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, all those in favor of adjourning. All right, there will be no executive sessions. Uh, thank you very much.